Good afternoon. Welcome to our uh, COVID-19 information session with Dr. Kara Christ. As a reminder, this session is on the record. I am setting everyone up to record in Zoom. Uh, it may take a minute to get some of the stragglers here, uh, but ping me in a minute if you're not set up to record. Uh, after Dr. Chris's presentation, we will be uh, taking questions, and please raise your hand in Zoom to ask a question. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Christ. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining me today. We're a little bit later than we normally do, um, so I hope everyone has had a great Friday afternoon. Um, this, I'm going to follow the similar format that we have in the past. I'll provide a brief presentation. It's got a little bit of a, a different flow of information this week but I'll definitely leave time at the end for any questions like usual. So I'm gonna start with uh, spending some time discussing the current COVID-19 data in Arizona, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about how public health interprets this data. So you've seen our epidemiologic curve. This is where we plot cases on the day that we get, uh, that their um, samples are collected so that we can follow the trajectory of uh, the pandemic. You can see that we've overlaid important mitigation strategies or events um, on top to see how they uh, impact our uh, pandemic and the number of cases that we have had. This is another look at uh, the cases in Arizona over time. You can clearly see the two peaks in case counts, one in the summer of 2020 and the other in the winter of 2021. What you'll also notice here is an increase in the number of cases per week in Arizona in recent weeks. About 90% of these new cases this month are in those who are unvaccinated. Case numbers are one important component of disease surveillance for public health, but the severity of the disease, how sick it makes people is another important metric that we monitor. For that, we use hospitalization data, which I'll share in a few slides. By now, hopefully all of you are familiar with our percent positivity chart. This one is a little different um, uh, than the one that's on our website. It shows the total number of tests and how many are in unique individuals and how many are in or, or repeat tests in uh, individuals that have already had a uh, previous test. This is important as we tend to get into the part of the pandemic where we are. Um, we use percent positivity, which shows the number or the percent of tests that are positive out of the total number of tests conducted. And we use this as a measure of community spread of a disease. However, we, we interpret this data very carefully because you have to have a context of uh, the, the testing as, as you're going through. So a lot of you will remember during 2020 and in the early part of 2021, Many Arizonans were going to get tested, not just because they felt sick, but also for routine monitoring purposes. Now that vaccines are widely available and more than half of Arizonans have chosen to be vaccinated, we expect that those who have been vaccinated will be less likely to continue with routine surveillance testing that they might have been participating in prior to becoming vaccinated. In addition, we have uh, other forms of testing coming onto the market, including over-the-counter testing. Um, these testing numbers are not necessarily reflected in the numbers that we have in the, the total number of tests performed in Arizona. So that's gonna change um, how much testing there is in the community. We expect that moving forward, that people who are symptomatic are gonna be tested in greater proportion to those that are asymptomatic. Um, which can increase the percent positivity um, because you'll have more people with symptoms who are going to have a positive result. Regardless though, we know by the case numbers that COVID-19 cases are increasing in Arizona, which is why it's so important to get vaccinated if you haven't already been vaccinated. We continue to monitor hospital data uh, through a, a variety of different sources. So this graph shows the number of inpatient beds in Arizona and the total number being utilized and then those being utilized by um, COVID patients. So if you look, the light gray at the very top are available beds. The dark gray are beds that are in use by non-COVID patients and the red is uh, the number of beds used by COVID patients. 
you can see that at the peak of our winter surge, COVID-19 COVID patients accounted for approximately 50 to 60% of all of the hospital beds in use, or actually of all of the beds that were, that were available. Um, as vaccinations uh, proceeded, you can see that we saw a dramatic drop in the number and percent of beds that were being utilized by COVID-19 patients. And over the last few months, we've ranged uh, to about six to eight percent of the, the beds being utilized by COVID patients. The total number of beds in use has remained relatively stable throughout. Currently, we are starting to see an increase in the percent and number of inpatient beds being used, with about 9 to 10% of the beds being used by COVID-19 patients. And we are seeing a similar trend in our intensive care unit or our ICU beds. When you take a look, you can see it that at the peak of our winter surge, the COVID-19 patients accounted for about 50 to 65 percent of all ICU beds. And again, we see that dramatic drop when um, vaccinations started to become common. You can see that over the last few months, uh, COVID positive patients uh, utilized about eight to nine percent of the overall capacity. And all beds, again, remained at approximately a relatively stable uh, capacity. You can see that we are seeing an increase over the last uh, week or so in our ICU beds being utilized by COVID patients, currently accounting for about 10 to 14 percent of the, the ICU beds. The department uses syndromic surveillance to assess hospital usage and how much of the capacity at a hospital is being utilized for uh, syndromes that are very similar to COVID-like illness. This was determined to be a very sensitive predictor for increases and decreases in hospital usage. You can see that over the past couple of months, hospital usage has been relatively stable per syndromic surveillance, but we are seeing a slight uptick in the percent of hospitalizations that are due to COVID-like illness. So one of the things that has become um, good data to, to have is our whole genome sequencing. And so this is how we determine the sequence of the viruses and um, what type of variants there are circulating in, in Arizona. You can see this is the uh, percentage of uh, specimens that have been identified as the Delta lineage um, over the past several months. You can see that that is increasing. We, one thing that we should clarify is not every single positive specimen is sequenced. Um, we sequence approximately 12% of all of the specimens over the last three months. They're sent for sequencing to partners. This is not a clinical diagnostic lab, so it's not reportable back to physicians and patients in Arizona. This is a public health surveillance that we partner with TGen, our universities, the state lab does some of that sequencing to get a good uh, idea of what variants are circulating in the community so that we can make recommendations on the population level. We partner very closely with TGen, and you can see from their uh, dashboard that we've seen an increase in uh, Delta from about 3% of the sequences being Delta in May to about 74%. So this is that light blue bar um, in the bars uh, on the left-hand side, the, but it's the right three bars. You can see that that light blue, the B.1.617.2 bar, that is our Delta variant, and you can see that that has increased um, significantly in the past two months. So we are seeing in the last several months that the main driver for the increase in COVID-19 cases is largely individuals who are not fully vaccinated. So the red line is uh, cases in those that are not fully vaccinated, and you can see that the gray line is those that are fully vaccinated. That percentage has uh, been decreasing as you look over the past couple of months as more fully vaccinated are. However, even in July, 90% of the cases have been in 
people who were not fully vaccinated. When you look at the deaths since March, approximately 98% of the deaths have been in individuals that are not fully vaccinated. And we look, and when we look at our hospitalizations that are not fully vaccinated since March, it accounts for about 94% of the hospitalizations are in individuals who are not fully vaccinated in Arizona. And again, this, this just shows the, the number of or the percent of cases that are fully vaccinated versus the percent of cases that are not fully vaccinated. And the majority of individuals who are uh, coming down with COVID-19 in the past few months are not fully vaccinated. I'm gonna go through a couple of uh, COVID-19 vaccine updates. So to date, 6.7 million doses of COVID-19 vaccine have been administered to 3.6 million uh, unique individuals. We've got 3.3 million who are fully vaccinated. Um, over 51% of Arizona's total population has received at least one dose of vaccine and 46% of the population has been fully vaccinated. When you look at the percentage of individuals who are eligible to be vaccinated in Arizona, so that is any individual who is 12 years old or older, 57% of the eligible Arizonans have been uh, received at least one dose. And vaccine coverage among our most vulnerable population, so our 65 and older, is high in Arizona. Nearly 90% of those individuals have received at least one dose of vaccine. And this is important because when you look at the deaths um, since the beginning of the pandemic, over 90% of the total deaths in Arizona have been in those that are 55 years of age and older. And as you look, almost 90% of our 65 and older are uh, vaccinated with at least one dose, and about 70% of our 55 to 64 year olds are, are vax have at least one dose. As of this week, nearly 32% of 12 to 17 year olds have been vaccinated with at least one dose of vaccine. And as we head back to school, we urge all of those who are eligible, including students 12 and older to get vaccinated. If you are still looking to find a vaccine site, um, we have over 1,600 provider sites that have received vaccine supplies, including 300 locations that are currently offering Pfizer. And that's important because Pfizer is the, the vaccine that is available for those 12 and older. We also currently have over 1,000 retail pharmacies that are offering neighborhood vaccinations. And so you can find them at almost all uh, pharmacies statewide to get vaccinated. On the right, you'll see our ADHS Find Vaccine app. It's been updated with a feature to search by vaccine type so that families who are interested in finding Pfizer for those that are between 12 and 17 years old can um, easily do that. This Saturday, we'll be uh, partnering with the One Community Initiative on a vaccination and backpack drive. It includes a backpack drive with backpacks and school supplies available for families who receive a vaccination at South Mountain Community College. You'll also see that we have a Sunday event in partnership with the Diocese of Phoenix, and the team has pulled together additional educational resources for faith-based leaders who are interested and greatly supportive of vaccine safety and encouraging their congregations to get vaccinated. And we've been partnering with the Equality Health Foundation, which is one of 13 uh, providers that uh, can operate under state contract to provide pop-up clinics. Um, and so you'll find a number of community-based uh, vaccination sites uh, in partnership with them. Um, we've got a, a couple of reminders to our uh, stakeholders. We do have provider communications available. So we, uh, you know, in working with stakeholders, we've identified that one of the most trusted sources for patients is hearing from uh, healthcare providers, their personal doctors or healthcare providers. We have developed tools in both English and Spanish that can support our Arizona healthcare providers um, in communicating with patients about COVID-19 vaccines. So this includes frequently asked questions, how to address uh, misinformation about vaccine, uh, giving information to your patient about what to expect after getting a vaccine or at their uh, vaccine appointment. 
Um, these can be found on our website. We do have the links um, in the document, but they are on our website at azhealth.gov. We've also developed educational materials for youth and families. We know that parents have a lot of questions about getting their young ones vaccinated. Um, there are toolkits and messaging if you are interested in um, working with uh, doing outreach um, or working with populations that may serve youth and their families. Um, and again, that can be found on our website at azhealth.gov. So just as a, a reminder of the key points, and then I'll turn it over for questions. Um, you know, 98% of COVID-19 deaths since March have been in those that are not fully vaccinated, and 94% of the hospitalizations are in those that are not fully vaccinated. Vaccine is, uh, is highly effective in preventing these bad outcomes. We want every Arizonan who is eligible to get vaccinated so that we can avoid um, hospitalizations and deaths due to COVID. And for anybody that's looking to find a safe, free and effective vaccine near them, you can go to azhealth.gov slash find vaccine. Thanks. Okay, director. Our first question is from Howard Fisher, if I can figure this out. Yes. Uh, uh, there we go. Well, I've missed us the last couple of weeks. It's been awful. So. Um, I have three basic questions. Um, yeah. You, the, the, in May, about 95% of folks were, uh, who got the, the uh, COVID were uh, unvaccinated. It dropped to 92 in June and like 90% this month. What's going on there? Are there just more breakthrough cases or is the vaccine less effective against COVID or what's happening there? So I think it's a combination of things, Howie, and that's a great question. So if you if you think we've got, we know that no vaccine is 100%, right? It, um, nothing is perfect. So we do know that people who have been vaccinated can come down with COVID-19. However, their, their outcomes are going to be less severe. There's less of a chance that they'll be hospitalized or die due to COVID-19. What we are also seeing though, we're seeing an increase in the number of vaccinated individuals. So that makes our pool a little bit higher for people who could potentially get COVID as a breakthrough case, but we're also seeing higher community transmission. So that's more, um, more opportunities for somebody to come into contact with COVID-19. Um, and, and so it, we think it's a combination of a, of, uh, of a number of things that are, are bringing that percentage down. Okay, second question. You mentioned that of the people who are eligible, we take out the 12 and under, we are at like 57%. Um, at the risk of putting a value judgment on, on it, that sucks. Uh, what are we doing wrong here? Uh, to, to, why are we getting more people vaccinated? We seem to be among the lower tier of states. We, we hate Missouri, but we, 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 we sure aren't uh, one of the more populated states. What are we doing wrong? So I think that there's a lot of misinformation out there about the vaccines. And we've been working um, on a couple of initiatives here. We'll be uh, issuing a number of social media uh, short films addressing directly some of the misinformation that's out there about the vaccines and clearing that up. Um, there's also a lot of fear about the vaccines. And so, um, you know, really trying to get people who are trusted communicators in the, the community healthcare providers, community leaders to talk about their experience with the vaccine, answer any questions, encourage those individuals to get vaccinated. I think um, once it becomes fully approved, that may uh, make uh, some of those that are hesitant to get vaccine when it becomes fully approved by the FDA. Um, we hear that a lot, that that's, that's one of the things that people are waiting for before getting vaccinated as well. Okay. Finally, you mentioned uh, the higher community transmission rate when you were answering the earlier question. Um, at what point do you say, do you recommend to the governor, or do you say, we really need to go back and look at some of the mitigation strategies we were doing? Whether it's masks, whether it's occupancy limits, uh, or, or something else. I mean. You know, the numbers are going up. I realize they're not what they were in, in, in January. But at what point do, do you decide, given the, the, the increased community transmission, that, well, maybe those mitigation strategies make sense and we ought to put them back? 
And that's a really great question, Howie. I think um, when you look, we're at a different place than we are in January, just like you pointed out. Um, you know, we do have the vaccine that's going to provide a level of protection. Our public health recommendations have not changed. So if you are unvaccinated, we recommend that you wear a mask whenever you are with people that you don't live with. Um, and, you know, taking that time to assess your risk, if you are high risk for an outcome, whether you're vaccinated or not, you know, is this an event that you should go to? Are there lots of people? Is it indoors? Do you know their vaccination status? And if not, you should you should wear a mask whether you're vaccinated or unvaccinated. So really taking a look at that risk, um, I think with the the, you know, the availability of vaccination and how effective it is at presenting ho preventing hospitalizations and deaths we might see an increase in hospitalizations and deaths but we're not anticipating the same levels that we saw back in um the the winter we continue to monitor but we didn't put additional mitigation strategies back in the winter um so i would imagine that we will just our recommendation is go get vaccinated and be fully vaccinated as quickly as possible. Okay, well, uh, I, I appreciate your, your optimism there, but we're gonna have to talk every week or two and see where those numbers go. Thank you. Thanks, Howie, I appreciate it. Peter Samar, hang on, Peter. Hi, Peter, sorry, I have One a frog time. in my throat. Peter, I'm having some problems, there you <clears> go. <throat> there we go, can you hear me okay? Yes. Very good, good afternoon. So. Any updates you're hearing from pharmaceutical companies or federal officials or anyone else as to when all kids can get the vaccine? I know it's 12 and under, uh, they can't touch them yet, uh, with the restrictions, so on and so forth. So we haven't heard a, a newly updated date. You, initially, they had told us uh, that it might be approved around September 2nd. Now we're hearing like uh, late fall, maybe uh, early winter. But we continue to work with those partners. I am very eager for 12 and under to get vaccinated uh, because I have two that are in that age category. So as soon as we find out, we'll let everybody know because we want to get as many people vaccinated as quickly as possible. Would that be for all brands? You know, I, I've heard the Pfizer was the September 2nd. Um, I think the general late fall, early winter is is the Moderna and Pfizer. Gotcha. And then, um, you show us numbers that the younger people, uh, younger adults, and even closer to middle-aged adults are the get, ones getting the sickest. Why are they avoiding the vaccine? Is it because they think they're invincible? But what are you seeing and hearing at all? I, I think it's a combination of both. Um, when or, or, or a number of things when you look at it. So I think yes, they're they're looking at the outcome. You know the outcomes. They're looking at um, you know that younger age group tends to be asymptomatic or not have quite as severe outcomes. Um, and so they don't feel that they need to get vaccinated. There's also all the misinformation. We get a lot of the questions about, will it affect my ability to have a baby? That would be an age group that that might impact. It does not impact your ability to have a baby, just to clarify that. Um, but uh, what, what we need that group to understand is yes, we are seeing more severe outcomes and COVID is predictably unpredictable. And you might be the 99% that it turns out okay. And you know you don't have long hauler symptoms, but you might be one of the 1% that it doesn't turn out okay. And you don't know which group you're in until you get COVID. Um, we, I have friends of mine that have gotten COVID and have been very, very sick. And these are healthy, young individuals. Um, so we would recommend everyone get vaccinated because we don't know how it's going to impact you, but you also don't know how it's going to impact others who may get it. And those individuals may be loved ones who are at high risk, like older relatives, grandparents, grandfathers. Um, so you want to make sure that not only are you protecting yourself with the vaccine, but you're protecting others with it as well. Katie Aaron interviewed somebody yesterday, uh, a widower actually, yeah. who uh, you, know, you might have heard the story. Mm -hmm. Do you think um, the horror stories are starting to get to people to you know get their vaccines? So yeah, that that story brought a tear to my eye. I um, it, it's it's unfortunate that. Uh, you know that we're that we lose people to covid um especially when there is a highly effective vaccine and i'm i'm you know 
I, I'm heartbroken for him, but I'm proud of him for making that decision to go to go get vaccinated based on his personal experience and then speaking out to encourage others because I, I can't even imagine that loss. It was tough. Yeah. Very, very difficult to hear for sure. Thank yeah. you for your time. I accidentally lowered the hand of a 15 representative, is it Danelle Gallardo? Sorry about that. You should be on Actually, it's Mark Phillips. Oh, <laughs> surprise. Hi. Hi, Doc. Uh, how are you? I, I have two questions I want to ask you. Yeah. And I want to make sure, since I don't follow this as closely as my colleagues here. But uh, as I understand it, the breakthrough rate has jumped from June to July from 5 to 10 percent. So when people who you are targeting, who are folks that for one reason or another don't want the vaccine, they don't believe in it, mm -hmm. or they are afraid of it, whatever, how hard is it now in your sales pitch to them when they hear the fact that, well, one in 10 people who have been vaccinated can get infected? How, how difficult does that make the sales pitch? That's my first question. <laughs> That's a great question. And it, it does make the sales pitch hard. I think um, one of the important things that people should realize is no vaccine is 100%, but the vaccine is has a really high efficacy in preventing hospitalizations and deaths. So even if you're counted as a potential COVID case, your case is going to be less severe, less likely to put you in the hospital, and less likely for you to die from COVID-19, which is ultimately what we want to prevent everybody from experiencing. Um, so what we would say is, you know, based on increasing numbers of vaccinated people, um, so you are going to see higher numbers, increasing numbers or increasing community transmission, which is going to give the virus more shots at vaccinated individuals and more tries at um, infecting those individuals, um, that can increase. But the, the efficacy of the uh, vaccine in preventing hospitalization and death is one of the main reasons you should get vaccinated. Okay, now my follow-up question. Yeah. The state's mitigation strategy is, if I understand, get vaccinated. The governor's been pretty clear. There's not going to be a mask mandate, vaccine, passports, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So my question is, if the state's prior, excuse me, <laughs> why is the priority, um, if we're still in the midst of a pandemic, uh, that we have basically appease the very people who are not taking the health concerns serious? Why, why are we doing more for them than for other folks who basically want to be saved. You know, I think that there's a lot of steps that people can take, and our public health guidance and recommendations have not changed. They, they have remained constant. Um, vaccination is the most effective means we have of preventing transmission. Um, what we would recommend, though, is unvaccinated individuals should wear a mask when they are out. That hasn't changed. We want people who are unvaccinated. We know Delta is out there. We know that it's more contagious. People should wear a mask when they are out. High risk individuals who may be vaccinated but may have a high risk for a severe outcome, those individuals should consider wearing a mask when they're out as well. Um, because we know we've got increased community transmission. And always, you know, we, we always recommend hand washing, staying home when you're sick. But these are things that people have to, to, to take on on their own. And so um, I, I don't know that we're uh, accommodating one group or another. I, you know, everybody needs to take the steps that they feel comfortable in in preventing COVID-19. But the best step that anybody can take is getting vaccinated. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Christina Durant. Hello. Hi. Hi, Dr. Chris. Thank you. So my question is, we're going into a school year mm -hmm. with rapid cases, prevalence of the Delta variant, and schools unable to mandate masks. Uh, so I want to know the likelihood of a larger outbreak and then the possibility of those outbreaks then affecting community transmission. And that's a really good question. As we look at, um, uh, anytime we look at bringing large groups of individuals back together, especially indoors, we could see an increase in the number of cases. Um, and that could go into the community. 
The best thing that parents can do is to get vaccinated if you have children under the age of 12. And our school guidance recommends that all unvaccinated individuals, which in this case includes children 12 and or under 12, wear a mask when they're indoors at school. Um, you know, as a parent, I've got I've got three kids, and I know a lot of you have heard this. My, my oldest is fully vaccinated, but I've got two that aren't eligible yet. And um, they went back to school on Wednesday and I, mean mom, me is making them wear masks at school. Um, from what I can tell, it sounds like a lot of their friends are wearing masks as well. So kudos to the parents who are, you know, making their, their children wear the masks. We also recommend making sure that you're doing those health screenings before sending your kids to school so that if they've got symptoms, keep them home. Um, so that they don't spread. Not only are we seeing um, COVID in the community, we're starting to see increased other respiratory viruses. So we just wanna make sure we're not spreading anything at school. So make sure that you keep your kids home when they're sick. And then um, just another question. I know how I mentioned maybe uh, upping our mitigation strategies, uh, but would there ever be a point where maybe even vaccinated individuals would have to go back to wearing a mask uh, in certain situations or anything like that? So, you know, there could be changes to the recommendations based on the community transmission. Um, you know, we do recommend that even fully vaccinated individuals who may be at high risk, if you're going to a large indoor gathering with people you don't know or don't know their vaccination status, that you wear a mask, even if you're fully vaccinated, just because there's gonna be a lot of people and you're gonna be indoors. Um, we continue to, to take a look at the data and may make a recommendation that if you're out in you know, large groups indoors, that everybody wear a mask, but that would remain a recommendation. Thank you. You're welcome. Next is Jared. Hi, Jared. Hi, thank oh, you for your time to take questions from us. Yeah. Um, uh, my question is, you know, the department's been doing uh, outreach uh, throughout, you know, this vaccine process in certain zip codes. Uh, you talked also about how, you know, you're doing some outreach in the South Mountain region, uh, I believe is what you said earlier. Yeah. Um, I was looking at the zip code da data, and it appears that there's a lot of kind of rural areas of the state that don't have, in some instances, any people who've gotten vaccines for large numbers of uh, cases. I was curious as to, if there's any plan um, in the near future, especially with you know cases of, of COVID kind of starting to increase here, to try to reach out to these more rural communities um, to get you know vaccines and arms out in those areas as well. Yes, that is that's a really great point. Um, we are epidemiologists. Um, look at the zip code data they look at some of those those smaller communities and then work with our local health departments to let our local health departments know hey here's what we're seeing in the communities what types of resources do you guys need in order to target because they're really the boots on the ground and they know those communities they know what's going to work in those communities um, and to offer the support that they may need because um, you know the, the contract that I talked about that we have with the One Community Initiative, we have that with multiple providers and those contracts are statewide so that we can send out vaccinators to those, to those areas. In some of the rural areas, like one of them's the San Luis Summerton area, we did do the same intensive a targeted outreach that we did in the South Phoenix area, you know, trying to go door to door, talking to people, arranging for them to get vaccinated, answering questions, doing town halls and those types of things. We continue to look at the benefit of that versus working directly through the local uh, health departments um, to engage those communities as well. But it is something that we're definitely working on. And you know, is, is that something that, you know, you so say you could continue looking at that, is that something that um, is, are you you're looking at or you're actively pursuing? I mean, you know, when you look at the history of the state, those rural areas are in some of the more um, healthcare provider shortage areas and during the first surge. So those areas like Tuba City and stuff were hit pretty hard during those first surges. So is that something that, uh, you know, the department is currently talks with those rural areas as we're you know, possibly looking at this current surge in cases. Yeah, that's exactly it. So we, we have been working with our local public health departments and are actively engaged with them. So um, 
as we continue to look at the data and identify new areas, our EPIs may point out those updated areas, but it's something that we've been working on because just like you said, trying to get healthcare to some of those rural areas can be a challenge with healthcare shortage providers or provider shortages, you know, a lack of access to potential like vaccine sites. So our contracts actually provide for mobile services and pop-up events so that those contractors can go anywhere where they are needed to provide vaccinations. Um, one last real quick question. Um, with this, you know, uh, kind of change in cases and, you know, we were looking at uh, hospital data earlier. Is there any possible plan to, um, or any possible talks about changes to, um, you know, I, I remember during the last uh, kind of uh, surge in cases, we uh, implemented some kind of, you know, plans for the hospitals to prepare for these, you know, extra cases. Is there any talk about uh, implementing any of those plans or any hospitals already looking at getting some of those plans in place prepared? So those plans have stayed in place. Um, they, they are required to have a, a staffing plan. They're required uh, a while ago to identify those additional surge beds in case they're needed. The Arizona surge line has been active and engaged the entire time. Um, so all of those are actually still in place and the hospitals still have the same types of strategies that they had during previous surges, you know, whether they want to bring in traveling nurses or they want to look at how to reduce the number of non-COVID patients. If the COVID patients go up, um, they have all of those options available to them. Thank you. Welcome. Next, we've got AZ Family. Hey there, it's actually Brianna Whitney. Hi, Dr. Hey. Chris. How are you? Thank you so much. Good, how are you? I'm good. Uh, I have two questions. One's COVID and one isn't. So I'm going to start okay. with the COVID. Uh, I know you've said um, in, in this in your, or this press conference and when we were talking earlier this week quite a bit about sending your kids to school with masks who are not eligible for the vaccine yet. But we did have the governor today tweeting more about his you know, anti-mask mandate for schools. Do you feel like the two of you are on different pages on this aspect moving forward for the school year in terms of kids wearing masks in certain situations? You know, I, I think the governor is, he, he follows the public health guidance. State law prohibits a mandate at the schools, but the recommendation that unvaccinated individuals should wear a mask when they're around that, um, I don't think we're on separate pages for that. And so it, it really is encouraging parents to understand that their, their kids are gonna be mixing indoors with other individuals. And so it's really important to wear masks. We know a lot of parents believe um, in parental rights and wanna have that decision-making authority left to them. And that's what this state law allows. Um, thank you. And then just one other question. So um, I'm assuming you probably saw this yesterday, but a horrible death at the Canyon Winds um, Assisted Living Center in Mesa, where the 90 year old man was left in a transport van um, for 20 hours and found dead. Um, they are on AZ Care Check. It looks like they have a pretty squeaky clean um, kind of citation list, only a couple of things. But at the same token, this is a, a completely heartbreaking situation. Is this something the state will be looking into, the state health department, and, and working directly with that facility in terms of any sort of uh, consequences or ramifications or, or anything that comes from this? Yeah, so this, this is a heartbreaking situation. And yes, we were notified and our team is on site today and has opened an investigation. Is it considered a criminal investigation or just a, a, an investigation in general? From our perspective, it would just be like the licensing um, uh, investigation. I don't, I, I'm, I'm sure that local law enforcement is involved and they would be doing a, a criminal investigation, but I can have Steve Brown back with you on that. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Hey, Lorraine. Hello. Hi, oh, good afternoon, Dr. Chris. Happy Friday. Um, yeah, I wanted to piggyback off the question that Brianna had just asked, um, just in regards to you and the governor's office being on the same page. I know that a spokesperson for the governor's office did say last week that, uh, you know, the language and the legislation that has been passed earlier this year about what schools are able to do when it comes to mitigation efforts um, is specific to schools and, I think, quote, 
uh, they said it's not the same as general public health guidelines. Um, so I know, you know, Superintendent Kathy Hoffman has herself said that um, she feels like schools are being unfairly singled out here when it comes to this public health guidance. Um, I know you just kind of touched on this a little bit, but could you talk a little bit more about, um, you know, the position of ADHS specifically and, um, you know, kind of the messaging from the governor's office that, um, you know, it is not the same thing or, uh, you know, yeah, uh, and just kind of, you know, that the guidance and mitigation measures for schools are not the same. Um, yeah, I, I was just hoping you could expound a little bit more on that. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I, I think there's been some confusion on, you know, what was um, said was state law versus the public health guidance. And I think that that's, that's what the governor's office was trying, was trying to convey. All of us believe that the best place for our children is in school. School offers a lot of benefits um, and public health strongly believes that kids should be in school and that's what we're working towards. That new law that was passed um, at the end of June prohibits schools from utilizing vaccination status or the use of masks for providing in-person services. And so what, what schools can't do is make a blanket recommendation that all unvaccinated individuals need to quarantine. But that's not how public health works and public health guidance um, has remained unchanged. So contact tracing with isolation and quarantine is still a tool that our public health departments can use in conjunction with schools. But they do that on a case by case basis. And so, you know, when we identify a confirmed positive case in a school, they do that contact tracing and we identify um, very close contacts. And that means they have had to spend a certain amount of time within a certain amount of distance in, in to the case. And then we work, public health will work with those individuals and their families to identify what is best for those individuals. And that's regardless of whether they are vaccinated or fully vaccinated. Now, what we can't do is say, oh, you're unvaccinated, you're definitely quarantined, but public health doesn't do that. Um, they will take a look. There may be recommendations that a fully vaccinated individual quarantine. They might have high risk individuals at home. They might be high risk, or we may just be looking at the community transmission in general and recommending that all close contacts be quarantined. So it's really a case by case basis. And it was just clarifying that law that you can't um, exclude children from in-person uh, services based solely on their vaccination status or um, whether or not they use a mask. I appreciate that. Thank you. And, uh, you know, jumping off of that point, um, you said that, you know, quarantining is still a tool um, and that, it, you know, it should be case by case. I believe in your blog earlier this week, you said, you know, um, it's a tool that should be used, I think, sparingly. Um, uh, but we know, I think, following the governor's office's letter to um, two Arizona school districts last week, that at least one district um, did decide to update their mitigation measures when it comes to quarantining, um, specifically, um, is going to make quarantine, quarantine optional for students who aren't exhibiting <laughs> symptoms. Um, I'm curious, you know, does the department's guidance on best practices when it comes to utilizing, you know, quarantining um, in the event that, you know, some school districts start to see increased spread of COVID-19 in their school communities? Um, I believe we're starting to see some of that in some school districts in Maricopa County. So, yeah, I'm curious uh, if and when the, the department might kind of update that guidance or, or um, yeah, if that messaging will change depending on how uh, the community spread starts to look in school districts um, as the school year gets going. So our, our guidance is a, a, a network of layered prevention strategies that, that range from vaccination to you know consistent use of masks, quarantine uh, or isolation in conjunction with contact tracing, um, you know, increasing the environmental uh, in, or like the environment, so increasing the ventilation, and then ensuring that you've got adequate hand washing and hygiene and keeping kids home when they're sick. So it's a number of uh, different strategies. And those are in alignment with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention guidance for uh, K through 12. I don't see us updating that unless the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention update their guidance. Um, the recommendation clearly, uh, when, you, when you look at CDC and when you look at our guidance, um, you know, everyone feels that the best place for our students is in schools. So even if a school is unable to implement all of the mitigation strategies, that's not a reason to not have in-person learning. 
Um, we would encourage, we, uh, you know, working in public health for, uh, for a long time, rarely do we get to mandate um, things. A lot of the, the mitigation strategies for a number of communicable disease, and, and I can use influenza as an example. Influenza is, can be very serious. It can kill children. But a lot of times we'll work with, on a voluntary basis. Influenza vaccine is not mandated for children. It does spread rapidly if it, if it potentially gets into a school. And if we identify cases, we may ask certain individuals to stay home. But a lot of times that's working and getting voluntary compliance with the families um, and with, with others. And so, you know, rarely do we quarantine for influenza. It could happen potentially if you had an outbreak. Um, but we use those same principles on a number of communicable diseases and we really do try to work with the families i mean we have legal orders that we can go to court and order somebody and um it has been very rare the number of times um, that we have ever had to do that most of the time we can get people to comply with recommendations i appreciate it thank you you're welcome bram resnick hi bram i can't hear you Oh, that's Steve. Sorry. I apologize for Steve. There we go. There we go. Sorry. There you are. <laughs> yeah, now you know how people at our morning Zoom meetings uh, feel about me. I, mean, I have a seven second delay. <laughs> um, so, granted, it is not February, um, but two public health experts this week, two experts who have been correct throughout this pandemic, project exponential growth uh, in the, uh, the virus. Uh, so, the question is, why wait for that to happen? Why not take measures now, more aggressive measures than you've already uh, proposed or following? So our recommendation really is that as many people get vaccinated as possible. We continue to monitor the cases and look at what the severity of those cases are. Um, and, and we'll make recommendation. However, there are new state laws that change some of the mitigation strategies that we have available. You know, when you look back at February and January and December, when we had some, some relatively high cases, um, you know, our recommendation was for those that were eligible, which was a very small number of people at, you know, when you look at December and January to get vaccinated. Um, but really, you know, making sure that people understand the risk, what the measures they can take are to prevent getting COVID-19, and then to make sure that they, they have access to the vaccine when they choose to get it. Well, talk about what the legislature and governor have done, because they have taken a lot of mitigation strategies off the table. The governor today told us what he wouldn't do. Are there any, any strategies you want back, you think we need to, to follow? That should not be illegal. <laughs> you know, not, not as mandates. I, I think um, in public health, we work with a lot of recommendations to, to um, that can keep people healthy. People determine what their acceptable level of risk are. I, you know, I joke because I'll never be caught in a car without a seatbelt. It makes me feel uncomfortable. But I'm going to be the one that eats the raw cookie dough out of the bowl. That's that's an acceptable risk to me. I, I got vaccinated as soon as I was eligible because that was not a acceptable risk. And I make my children wear masks because they're unvaccinated. Um, so I think, you know, we continue to keep our public health guidance the same. Rarely do we have the authority except in public health emergencies and stuff to potentially issue mandates. Um, so I would just encourage everybody to follow the public health guidance. It works. We know that it works and get vaccinated as soon as possible. So you're comfortable with all these new laws uh, that were enacted to limit mitigation trend? Yes or no? You know, it doesn't it doesn't inhibit our ability to make recommendation and guidance, which is normally what we do in public health. Um, and, and so, you know, I I, I would say that that would be a, a great question for the legislature and its members. That's a question for you. <laughs> Does it limit your ability? And what, as what the legislature, as what the legislature and governor done, limit your ability to fight this pandemic? You know, I, I think we're in such a different point. I don't know that we need those mandates. You know, you watch what happens in other states, and a lot of the states are experiencing the same thing that we are, whether they have mask mandates or not. And so, you know, I think we we did have local mandates here. The people that were going to wear masks wore masks and the people that weren't 
didn't wear masks. And so, you know, you have to have the ability to be able to enforce that, which we did in the in our jurisdiction. Um, but it wasn't it wasn't necessarily enforced. So I don't really know how much those mandates really helped because it really was left to the people that were going to do it. We're going to do it. Last question, if I can, sort of about thinking outside the box. Much of what we've heard about uh, the you know, solutions here is get a shot. Mm -hmm. um, that's been a recommendation for a while. It's not working with a lot of people. Um, in an interesting conversation yesterday with two public health experts, they say one of the biggest obstacles is people don't want to take time off work, unpaid time off, to go get a shot or to be sick, because some people get sick after a shot, or to care for a child, you know, after they get a shot. Mm -hmm. What can you, what can the governor's office do to work with business to help make that pay time off happen? And that's a great question. I think, um, you know, we've been encouraging employers to provide time off after people get a shot because you are exactly right. People can have side effects. Um, and they can feel like they've got the flu or flu-like symptoms for uh, a day or two after they get the vaccine and, and having to take care of children. If they get a fever and can't go to school or child care um, can be an issue. And so that is a, a, an issue that we've brought up. Um, working to get uh, paid time off, uh, is that's a challenge. And so trying to partner with, with some of those individuals to encourage that. Um, it is something that we'll continue to work on. Do you blame people who aren't getting shots for this new spike? You know, I, 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 do, I, I don't place blame. I, I, I think that there's a lot of hesitancy out there. I think that there's a lot of misinformation that scares people about getting the shot. Um, I hate to see the numbers increasing when there is a tool out there that would prevent people from having to get sick and having to suffer through this. Um, and, and that's something that we're gonna continue to work on. I don't know that it's blame because really it's, it's hurting the individuals that get COVID-19 and I, I, that I just want everyone to avoid getting it. Thanks very much, enjoy your weekend. Thanks Bram, you too. Juan Juarez. Hello. Hey doctor. Nice to see you again. It's been a while for me. <laughs> How are you? Uh, great, thank you. Um, so I wanted to ask you a couple of things, and one just came to my mind before the other question that I wanted to do. Oh, okay. But um, right now, uh, I was looking at your page. It's got about 1,400 uh, cases reported today. Mm -hmm. So from all the large increments that we've seen, how severe, if you have any data or information, how severe have the sickness being for people getting infected since um, it's being primarily the Delta variant that they're catching. How sick are people? Because uh, obviously we knew from the past, some people had mild symptoms. So how, how much is it affecting the people that are getting sick right now? So I think we're seeing the same broad range of impacts from COVID-19 with Delta. You do have people that are asymptomatic, um, especially those that, that may have already received the vaccine. And we have people that are getting hospitalized and dying. Um, anecdotally, I've heard from our healthcare partners that people seem to be getting sicker faster. Um, and I don't have a lot of great data on that. The data that I have, you know, shows that we're starting to see a slight increase in hospitalization usage, which indicates that, you know, that based compared to a couple of weeks ago, we are having people with more severe disease. Um, but it'll still be a couple of weeks before we have a good handle on how much of that there is because hospitals tend to lag about two weeks behind the cases and then deaths a couple of weeks after that. But we continue to monitor. I think, you know, one of the, the really good things is that we prioritize our vulnerable individuals very early on. So those over the age of 65, those living in congregate settings, um, you know, our first responders, healthcare workers and law enforcement and teachers. Um, we had really good uptake at the beginning, and you know, like I like I showed, almost 90% of those over 65 and above, which account for the majority of the deaths and have accounted for the majority of the hospitalizations, um, that's going to decrease the outcome in those individuals. So um, we're we're carefully watching to see how this 
you know, if it continues to be an increase, what that looks like for severity. And you're saying people are getting sicker faster and it is seen that it is affecting them more than before? You know, that's anecdotal. What I've heard from the healthcare partners, we don't have any data to, to show that. All I have is the, the hospitalization data, which right now is showing a slight increase in usage, but nothing compared to the winter that we saw. So it's, it's a little early right now to, to talk about the severity that, that we're seeing. Okay. So now the, the question that I had originally was uh, obviously the governor put out the statement today urging people to get vaccinated uh, with Delta variant uh, increase of cases. However, at the end, he pretty much says that um, he's not going to be doing any lockdowns. He's not going to do any mass mandates. So if the situation continues like we see it, and if you are truly worried about the increase in the cases, what's going to happen next if we don't see a change? So our, you know, our, our main message is we've got a highly effective vaccine that prevents hospitalizations and deaths. And we are encouraging every Arizonan to be fully vaccinated. And the key is fully vaccinated because we know one one dose with uh, when you're dealing with the Delta variant does not provide as great protection as two doses do. So we would recommend, um, you know, as many people as possible get vaccinated because that's the best prevention tool we have. So if, if people, if the vaccination, we've seen a slowdown, but if the vaccination doesn't increase more than what it is now, you have anything that you plan to do? You know, our guidance remains the same. We recommend that unvaccinated individuals wear a mask. We recommend that, you know, you stay home when you're sick. You don't go to large crowds, um, especially indoor crowds with people that you don't know their vaccination status. And we'll continue to maintain that guidance as, as long as we have COVID circulating in our community. All right, thank you. Thank you. We have a couple more minutes and Howie is back with a bonus question. Hi, Howie. Hey, the right, thank you. There. Real quick technical question. You mentioned about 57% of those eligible mm -hmm. uh, have been vaccinated, at least 43%. Of the 43%, what percentage of those are just one dosers as opposed to people who just have decided I'm not going to get vaccinated at all. Any thoughts on that? Um, I'd have to take a look and see. We do know the number of fully, I don't, I don't have that number off the top of my head, but we can get you how many were fully vaccinated versus just have one dose versus have zero doses. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking at 43%. That's a big chunk. And if, uh, and if a lot of them are people who just said, I'm not going to get it. That's uh, gets back to the questions that everybody was asking about this sort of insurmountable hurdle here. So. Fair enough, I will anxiously await a call from Steve. Perfect. Looking forward to it, Howie. Uh, Peter Seymour, bonus question. Hi, Peter. Thanks for the bonus, I promise this will be quick. So if someone has a breakthrough case, do you recommend them getting a, another vaccination three months later, perhaps? No, so we don't recommend right now getting a, a third or a booster dose at this time. We continue to work with our federal partners and the drug manufacturers um, as they make recommendations. But ultimately, that you know that infection is going to serve as another boost uh, in their own because their immune system is going to respond. It's going to learn it better um, and should help protect them the next time. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Right. One more question from Johnny Cordova. Okay. Hard time on muting today. There you go. Hi, Dr. Price. Hi. Doctor, thanks, thanks for uh, taking my, my question. So um, going back to schools, mm -hmm. is plan to um, work with uh, any third parties to um, monitor like the health of uh, students and teachers? So there's, there's a number of things that we're doing. Um, our local public health departments, so our county and tribal health departments work very closely with their schools. Um, you know, on as cases are identified, we're also offering um, a, a testing solution if schools are interested in volunteering to do surveillance testing um, at the cost to the state. Um, and that's something that they can do to do surveillance testing because we know a lot of uh, younger individuals have asymptomatic disease. 
Um, and so, you know, we've got a lot of tools and resources on our website at azhealth.gov. You can click on the schools box and there's there's a lot of different things that schools can do to help monitor this, the health and safety of their staff and students. Thank you, and if I may do a uh, quick follow up. Yeah. Uh, the numbers started going up for the number of cases uh, within the last, maybe now I think it's uh, 13, 14 days. Mm -hmm. The only, when we had less than a thousand was on Sunday, when we had 980 cases. So uh, is there a particular incident that point? Uh, you know, I, I don't know that there's one specific incident or event that we're looking at as, as a potential cause for the increase. I, I think that, you know, as we get Delta in the community and it's been in our community for a little bit, it's, it's much more contagious, can spread to more people more easily. And we think that the increase in cases is just that um, establishing itself as the predominant strain in Arizona. And so that's why we're seeing the increases. There was talk of uh, July 4th and also the Suns games. Okay. Would you say events uh, uh, help maybe to spike the number of cases? And do you think, do you foresee that they're going to be now going down? Um, we'd have to take a look. It, it's hard to tell and pinpoint to some of those those events. Um, definitely, whenever you get people together in large groups, especially indoors, you you do increase the risk of transmission. Um, and, and so that that could be. And if it was due to events, then hopefully we would see a decrease. But given what we're seeing with the the Delta variant, my uh, anticipate my. I, I would expect us to continue to see increases in cases for a while. Okay, it's after four. Dr. Chris, thanks for your time, and we thank everyone for joining us today. Thank you.